welcome to An Honorable Profession, a podcast giving America hope since 2018. I'm your host, Ryan Coonerty. The New Deal and An Honorable Profession just celebrated our second podcast anniversary. We've had so much fun bringing you the best of American leadership. If you haven't already, please check out some of our previous episodes with leading mayors, attorney generals, state legislators, and the thinkers shaping the future of the Democratic Party. Even in these difficult times, these folks keep me inspired about American politics, and I hope they do the same for you. Find out more at newdealleaders.org. Welcome to an honorable profession. I'm Debbie Cox Bolton, CEO of the New Deal. We're proud to support so many of the inspiring leaders you hear on this podcast. In this episode, I love speaking with longtime New Deal leader, Loran Osley, who was just elected to the Florida State Senate last week. We taped the episode last Friday, just before the election was called for President-elect Joe Biden and Vice President-elect Kamala Harris. We want to congratulate them on their inspiring and historic election and know that they will bring a return to leadership that fights for all Americans and seeks to unite the country. We look forward to working with them on solutions to our biggest challenges. Lorraine and I talked about the election and what it will take for Democrats to win Florida again, as well as Lorraine's own journey from political staffer to elected leader, why she's so passionate about early childhood education, and what being an Ironman triathlete and state legislator have in common. As we move from campaign to governing, we all have a lot of work ahead of us to renew and rebuild America, and I have hope that we can get there with people like Senator Osley leading the way. All right, Lorianne Osley, welcome to an honorable profession. Thank you. It's great to be here, Debbie. Great to see you. I want to start by saying just a huge congratulations. Our uh, listeners will be very excited to know that you won your state Senate race in Florida this week. Um, And I want to come back and I want to talk about that race in in a little bit of detail. But um, given that you and I are talking this afternoon while we're still waiting for votes to be counted uh, in the election, I'm sure uh, one of the things the listeners will want to hear from you uh, as someone sitting in Florida is what happened. I think Democrats were... um, you know, optimistic, right, that we were going to get a big victory in Florida uh, coming out of the gate Tuesday night that, that would kind of put everything to rest. Um, and uh, and it didn't really happen that way, particularly some things um, with the vote, maybe if Cuban Americans in Miami or other things we're hearing. But from from on the ground, what's what's kind of your analysis of uh, what happened in the presidential? Well, you know, I'm in a completely different part of the state than, than I'm, I'm way north. And we had good turnout, like it's stellar turnout up here, thankfully. Um, and I think, you know, we're still, the jury's still out, but clearly something happened in Miami in the South Florida area. And the, and I mean, we, in the, in the state house, we lost a number of seats. We lost two congressionals. We are still in a, in a recount for one Senate seat, but there's a, there's a, a lot to be unpacked there. Um, I, I, they, the Republicans started with this, you know, this socialist message um, and they were, it, it, we were, I, I guess, not able to, um, surpass that. And, you know, we did win a mayor, mayoral seat, um, Daniela Levine Cava, who is a Democrat and she won countywide. Um, so, but they effectively were able to combat that socialist message. And it's something in the Cuban American community, particularly that was apparently very resonant. I mean, that, that is a community that we, we, you know, spent a long time um, messaging to, and I guess, you know, we'll see what, when when it's all done, we'll see what happened. Yeah. Do you think there's other things that you, storylines you think will be coming out of Florida in terms of uh, how, you know, groups we didn't get or how we're going to need to expand our, our broaden our appeal going forward? I mean, I still think we, we have a lot of work to do on voter registration. I think everybody's kind of recognizing that. Um, I think that it, we were, we got the ground game, you know, we, we were, we're, we were practicing CDC guidelines and not getting, you know, and from the top of the ticket on down and they were not, um, you know, Repu- there's many of my Republican colleagues who still talk about COVID being a hoax, um, and, you know, not wearing masks. And so, you know, how much, I don't know how much that played into that, this, but we'll, I think as we start to unpack, we'll figure that out. 
Yeah, and as I'm transitioning to a to a conversation about your Senate district, your um, rural areas, right? You're going to be representing a, a pretty diverse uh, district in the Senate. Anything about rural areas and the presidential level in Florida that for us to keep an, our, our eye on going forward? Well, it's the same. You know, we've been talking having this conversation for a long time. Um, my district is 11 counties, and um, I won two of those, um, and the other nine are. are significantly, you know, supported Trump overwhelmingly. And um, part of the messaging of my campaign was really trying to define myself as a Democrat for the two counties that I won. And that's the reason I won. Um, but it alienated, unfortunately, I believe the rest of the, the, the nine counties. So my job as a senator going forward is to sort of earn the trust of these rural voters who don't don't know me, weren't able to, I wasn't able to go out, shake their hands, look them in the eye, which I had intended to do um, because of COVID. So it's, you know, for me, it's going to be, um, you know, letting them get to know me and my, you know, my work ethic and, all, and, and same issue that we have as Democrats, our, our values and finding those shared values and finding the common ground and not allowing what I believe is sort of the, the you know, president at the top of the ticket to, send us into our corners and into these divisive, this divisive um, world, trying to come back to, to, to building bridges rather than tearing each other apart. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, I think it's a conversation we're going to be having at the national level as well, for sure. And it sounds like Joe Biden is ready to have that conversation, but it's going to be important. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, about the, about the win that you had. Um, again, uh, for, for our listeners, you've been in the state house for 12 years, um, in two different stints and, and are making the jump to the state Senate. This, um, I know this, this race for you was a particularly nasty one. It got, um, and, and I, and I'm wondering, you know, how you feel about that. And also kind of whether, you know, having been in politics for a while, whether this campaign was different, you know, and, 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 and if so, is that, was that kind of an anomaly or do you feel like there's a trend in how campaigns are being run and, and what does that mean for kind of our, our Republic and people who want to go into public service? So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to dwell too much on it because I try, I try to take the advice that I give to other people that once, you know, you've got to put the campaign behind you and move forward. But um, this was a, the ugliest campaign I've ever seen. And, you know, lots of personal attacks, nothing but lies and distortions and sort of distracting. There was never any policy discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, as much as I tried to drive it, it just, it was, it was it really what we've quantified is um, 2.3, 2.3 million that we can find that they spent on TV and mail. And, th- and this is not an Orlando or a Miami market. That is a lot of money to be spent in in the, in the North Florida market, um, and I spent around a million. So I was more than and more than doubled my spending, um, and it was just ugly. Some of it worked. I mean, you know, we have polling that shows that the these lies people believed them, and you know, it, so we had to put fight back and push back, and um, and so I. But you know, to your question, I think it, it's unfortunately we saw it across the state. And it is, I, again, back, I think I've mentioned this in the answer to the previous question. So much of this is licensed by Trump. We've entered a new realm in American politics where the truth just simply doesn't matter. And I believe that the, the voters in my district said, yes, the truth does matter. Um, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm proud that, that they saw through this and, and, you know, really fortunate that we had the resources to be able to, to, to make that case. Um, other in other parts of Florida, we weren't so lucky, and um, I, and I do think it's it has a severe impact on our republic. If we are at a point really where truth doesn't matter, you know what what does that what does that mean? I mean, you know, who's going to go into public office if if their, your opponents can just say anything and and the public believes it and they've just put enough money behind it, it it's effective. And I, I don't know what the answer is, but I, I, you know, after having gone through this, I sure hope we find it. Yeah, I know. I think it's it's so important. I mean, all of these institutions, whether it's governing or campaigning, um, you know, we have to have we have to have some kind of rules, right? That, and, to, and to your point, you know, elections at the end of the day are about 
uh, the beginning, right? They're about transitioning then to governing. You run for office so that you can then govern. And so um, I think that that's important that we don't, you know, uh, erode that so much that then the, 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 the act of governing becomes uh, suspect. So when we think about that transition for you, um, I'm, I'm curious. So you're, again, you're going from the House. You represented about 150,000 people, I think, in Tallahassee. Um, and you've mentioned already you've got a, a district. Uh, it's 470,000 people, I think, you're, you're representing now. And, um, and you are already a senator, as you mentioned. This, you become a senator immediately. You've got 11 counties. So I'm curious about kind of what you're seeing the difference as just from a governing perspective, you know, being in, you know, one of a 40 now as opposed to one of 20, uh, of 120. Like, what is what are you thinking about in terms of how governing is going to look different for you as an elected official making that jump? Well, I mean, I know just from, you know, conversations and just having been in this process, the Senate is a, is a, is a different um, entity, you know, it's a, it's a much, at least has been a much more collegial body where even members of the minority party have a voice and are, are, you know, are respected for the number of people that they represent, which is not always the case in the house. Although, you know, I've spent my career really trying to overcome that and because I've always been in the minority uh, and worked, figured out a way to work with the other side to get things done. Um, you know, I'm hoping that it's not going to be as much of a bit of an uphill climb and that I can actually sort of really get to work on things that are important to this district because there's a lot of challenges. We have, you know, the Western part of this district is still struggling from hurricane Michael category five hurricane. And it was already struggling before the hurricane. Um, the, the folks in those district in those counties uh, and, and, and just, you know, COVID has, I believe, uncovered a lot of sort of fault lines that existed underneath the surface um, that are that are really exposed now. You know, a, a decades of disinvestment in public health, public education, um, as has been noted throughout the country, a very broken unemployment system that really failed our our people, uh, and you know, just the economic crisis that we we find ourselves in is, you know, is is exponentially felt in these smaller rural communities. But I believe it also presents opportunities. I think a lot of people are going to want to move out of big cities. And, you know, what a better place to move to beautiful, if people want to move to Florida, we have beautiful communities. But the big issue that is uh, lacking in these communities is broadband. And we, you know, New Dealers have talked about this a number of times throughout COVID. I've been working on that issue before COVID. And, it becomes even that much more important as something that is, um, I think, the, 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 it, it is the barrier um, between real economic development in some of these communities. If, you know, people, yeah, somebody might want to move from New York to Apalachicola, Florida, but if there's not good internet, they're not coming. Yeah. Are you optimistic then that there's some common ground that can be found on some of those critical issues? I am. I, you know, there are, I, I, I've had some success in the House, you know, even before representing rural areas, uh, merge, you know, joining forces with other uh, members who represent rural areas. So I, you know, I want to continue to do that um, in the Senate. And, um, you know, there, I, again, I hope that we are, after going through what we have, what we are continuing to go through COVID um, in the economic crisis that, that we will find a way to come together and, and start really, addressing these these real challenges facing Floridians. Yeah, and across the country, frankly. It's time to get to, get to some of those for sure. Well, as you know, An Honorable Profession is really about a podcast at the end of the day about public service. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about your own journey and um, how you found yourself in public office. So let's start with the fact that um, you're a sixth generation Floridian. And I did not, I, we've been friends a long time. I did not know until I started researching this for, for this conversation that your great grandfather served in the Florida House in, in, in 1891 is what I see here, which is uh, amazing. Uh, I know your father uh, or your grandfather was also in the Florida Senate. So, and in fact, I, and I read an interview that, that you talked to your dad about your first run. He, your dad's a very well-respected political advisor in Florida and he tried to talk you out of running, apparently you said, the first time you ran. So I guess to start with kind of, how was your family's involvement in public service so long? Did that impact you and how you thought about public service growing up? Well, sure. I mean, I grew up in Tallahassee, which is the capital. And so, you know, my, my dad, particularly, and his father have always been involved in some way, you know, whether it be my grandfather as a member of the Florida Senate for a short time, or my dad, who um, actually ran for a, a variation of this Senate seat, um, it unsuccessfully it was closed. But uh, instead, that was kind of my first 
I, I guess, entree into politics was as an 11 year old kid going around these rural parts of Florida with my dad and my mom, literally singing the campaign song from the back of the pickup truck. You know, it was, and we would go, we would take the wood panel station wagons and the motorcade and go from town to town. It was really cool. And we, re, we, we recreated some of that this time, which was really, really fun. But, um, but my, you know, I just, from my, I've been very fortunate to, um, to have seen firsthand what public service looks like. And, you know, from my family and then from my first job in politics with Bob Graham, you know, who was the governor of Florida at the time running for the state Senate, the U.S. Senate and worked with him in his office and came, you know, worked in the Clinton administration, you know, did a lot, worked with a lot of very um, inspirational public servants. And uh, I don't know if I ever envisioned myself running, but, you know, one thing led to another and a seat came open and I ran. And it's, um, yeah, it's been the privilege of a lifetime. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that the early experience you had working for elected officials as a staffer. I think that we have a fair number of listeners who probably um, are staffers for, uh, for elected officials. You know, how did that, what are some of the things you worked on and, and how did that play into making you decide that, yeah, I actually want to run myself someday? Yeah, you know, I mean, it just from the very first campaign days back in, that was in the 80s and it was a very different way of campaigning. Um, but to, to some great experiences with, in the Clinton administration, um, and, you know, I had, had the opportunity to work with, with Andrew Cuomo at HUD when he was the assistant secretary and did some really interesting work in inner city revitalization and worked at commerce, um, when Ron Brown was a secretary and worked on the first ever white house conference on tourism. So really, I, I mean, kind of two of the coolest jobs that one could have in, in the federal government. Um, working on inner city revitalization and and in, in tourism, which actually all of those things have sort of built into the foundational work that I've done. And you know, it's Florida tourism important. So having that background's been um, interesting and helpful. Um, but I, you know, I think I again, I, if we have a lot of listeners that are that are working um, in the process and and thinking about running. Everything that you're doing, everything that you do in a campaign or in a, you know, in, in these positions gives you the skills and the, you know, the, the, the background to one day run yourself. I mean, every single thing that I've done has built, built into um, my, I believe, my life as a, as a successful public servant. Yeah. Was there a time, Lorraine, when you were in the administration and in Washington, D.C., that you thought you might stay there and make a career? Or what was it What was it that, that brought you back home? Well, what brought me back home was the opportunity to work for Lawton Childs and Buddy McKay. So Lawton Childs was the, you know, he had a storied career as a, as a state senator, as a U.S. senator, and then came back and ran for governor with Buddy McKay, uh, another long public time public servant. And the two of them sort of, um, you know, they, they, it was like the dream team and, and Buddy was a good friend of my father's and he was running against Jeb Bush. And so I, they asked me to come back to, to serve as his chief of staff, um, in those last two years. So it, it, I think I always knew I was going to come back to Florida. Tallahassee's my home. And I, I, I knew that I, 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 didn't, I thought I'd practice law here. Um, and it was a great opportunity to really, you know, jump in and learn about state government. I'd grown up all around it, but I hadn't actually, you know, lived it and experienced it. And so serving as chief of staff to lieutenant governor um, in a really with, with a, such a dynamic leader as Lawton Childs gave me a, a great insight into the state legislative process. Yeah, I, I actually want to talk about another race you ran too. So you, you did, you ran for the House, as you said, that, that was a, a, the decision you made. And then after eight years, I think there was an opportunity to run statewide. Uh, and you ran for a, a, a position there that's called CFO, Chief Financial Officer. Um, you ran a great campaign, but we're, we're was not, we weren't successful ultimately. And I was just thinking about actually, A, how many people run for office unsuccessfully. You're in great company, Bill Clinton, but Pete Buttigieg, lots of people have lost races. And I'm curious about from, from your perspective, when you look back on your career, kind of, you know, what you learned from losing a race, right? And, and then obviously you came back successfully to run again, uh, run again, which others have done too, and including those two examples. But, um, you know, what, what about losing a race? How, how, what, what kind of lessons does that teach, teach somebody? You know, it, it's, um, it, it's, 
I think everybody should go through it, frankly, because it just gives you the sense of humility that is, um, is important in this process. And it gives you a perspective, you know, for me, I think anybody that has been through this, when, you know, if you've been in public office, out of public office, coming back to public office, uh, I, I think I, I just have a real, um, a realistic view of what, uh, of what we're, of what we're, our purposes here. You know, it, it's, um, it's, it's real easy to get caught up in the, I'm so important and this is, this job is so important and everybody loves me and everybody, you know, and, and you know, the day after you're not, at, when you're not in office, you really find out who your friends are. <laughs> you find out what's important. And, um, and then, so then coming back, you realize it's really not about me. This is really about the, the, the public, the service. And it's about, I mean, you know, whoever's in this job is going to, you know, do it their own way, but it's, um, I don't know. It's just, it was a, it's a, it's, it, you realize, I guess, how fleeting this, um, this in, importance is and try to use it for the best good that you can. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And it is, it's so, um, I mean, public service is such a, such an honor and a privilege. And, you know, when we talk to elected leaders, they, they often say that it's also a sacrifice. And, you know, and I think people need to understand that, right. And we just talked about your campaign earlier that, um, you know, it was a rough one this time along, but, you know, it's, it, you give up a lot too. So to, for, for you, you know, what, how do you think about the balance between kind of those, those sacrifices you make with your family and being out there in public and being scrutinized versus the upside of being able to really make an impact? How, how do you think about that? Well, and I guess maybe that, you know, the being in, being out and coming back in, it, it really makes you uh, underscore that importance of that balance because the balance is really important, um, especially women. You know, those of us who, I mean, I, I had my son when I was in the legislature and you know the story. I mean, he was born very prematurely. He was in the hospital for four months. I was running back and forth between the hospital and the, and the Capitol. And thankfully, I live here. So, it, you know, it, I live in Tallahassee, the seat of government. So my sacrifices are not, ha- you know, are, are minuscule compared to people who, moms, women, dads who come from, you know, 12 hour drive away um, to, to, to the seat of government. So it, I think that balance is really, really important in figuring in, in you know, how, how do you juggle all of these? And, you know, we're a citizen legislature, so I'm, I have a law practice. I mean, I got to, you know, and like almost everybody in, in public life does so many different things. And, you know, I have so many projects that I work on in the community that oftentimes I feel are more important. But, you know, that, that platform where, that allows me to be the convener um, of these I think great community um, initiatives. Um, sometimes that's more important than the legislative work that we do. Um, but but tr- you know you're right. Trying to find that. Um, how much time do I spend on my legal career? How much time do I spend on my family? How much time do I spend on this you know this legislative work? Um, and then how what do I do for my volunteer work? And and um, but I think it's it, it's it's important to figure figure out for yourself what allows you to find that balance. I mean, for me, as you know, it's, it's exercise and sometimes yoga. Those are things that, that, that give me the ability to, to, to compartmentalize when I need to and get, get the, you know, create that balance. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to, I want to follow up on a couple things you, you mentioned there. One is I was going to ask about your amazing son, Will, and, um, and, and he's, I think, 17 now, right? Um, so uh, it was 17 years ago that you had him, was, as you said, while you were in the legislature, and there were some special circumstances that made it the balancing even, even trickier. I'm curious whether you see, whether you think anything has changed for women specifically or parents more generally um, about being a parent in the legislature over 17 years or, and are there other things that we should be doing to try to, you know, support people who want to both be parents and, and serve? Yeah. I mean, I think it's pretty difficult to have a young child in this process in Florida for, for certain because the travel is so difficult and, and it's, you know, for me, again, I live here and it was, you know, not as, not as much of a stretch, but if I live somewhere, I, I don't know if you can do it with young children. I don't know that you, it's possible. And I think that's, 
unfortunate because I think that voice of a of young parents is a really important voice that ought to be a part of this policy making process. Um, but you know, parents of young children have so many so many things going on, and you know, so has it be become any changes in seventeen years? Uh, clearly, there are more women in the process, and so that's a, a good thing. Um, a lot more, I've, I believe, younger women that haven't started their families yet and um, have chosen this as a, you know, as their family for, for lack of a better way of describing it for now. And I, I that's a, um, it's a sacrifice that that women often have to make. Um, but I, you know, I think those younger voices are really, really, really important to have in this process right now. And I'm, I'm encouraged by what I see here in Florida, just in advocacy and the, you know, in the, the summer of, of um, peaceful protests and the, the, you know, we obviously went through Parkland and those kids were just so inspiring. And I see that same um, level of, of passion in, in this, in, you know, this group of kids that are um, not just kids, but young people all across our country that are in response to um, our racial reckoning that we are, that we're, you know, that's long overdue in this country that we're finally, I think, having this conversation. Yeah, I know the Parkland uh, specifically, that's, we didn't talk about that earlier. Um, I think a, a Parkland uh, widow is someone who lost someone in Parkland won a seat. Is that true? No, um, but uh, somebody who was inspired by coming up here on the, she, she lives in Park. She lived, she actually just lost this, this time around, unfortunately. Oh, okay, okay. But she, uh, um, she, she was a part of that Parkland movement and she found her voice through that and yeah. was elected in a swing seat. And unfortunately, it was in South Florida. And so that was one, one that we lost. Okay, that's too bad. Yeah, I was just I was just thinking about how, to your point, you know, how inspiring. I mean, there's been so much, right? So, and you know, you were talking about the unrest and the protests, and um, you know, just how in th- it's, how that is really translated. It's, it feels like into more people running for office, realizing more voting, obviously the big turnout. You know, just the 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 importance of that engagement in the political process. And I had, and it was a great connection you're making with Parkland, which obviously we've seen in Florida, uh, but really the impact they've had around the country has been a. a remarkable a remarkable job I know that you worked with them uh, closely right after the uh, the tragedy to think about some legislation in, in Florida I don't know if you want to say anything about what if you think anything's going to happen uh, on some of those issues uh, next session or not well you know the interesting thing is that if that if Parkland had not taken place while we were in session I don't think that any of those changes would have happened mm-hmm. um, you know we happened to be in session we happened to be sort of near the end of session and they those you know those kids got on a bus and they came up here to tell us what 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 was important to them and we had to listen they had to you know everyone had to listen because the the nation's eyes were on them and on us and um while at the end of the day you know we actually went farther than i could ever have dreamed uh, on some common sense safety gun safety um changes you know we still put the guardian program, you know, guns in the classroom and those, those kind of conversations are still going on. Uh, so, but I, you know, they are the, you know, mom's demand action sort of sprung up out of that. And we have a very strong chapter here in Florida and here locally that just, that, that those women in the, you know, they, they have been doing the work before Parkland um, at which I think really mom's demand action laid the groundwork for the Parkland kids to then come in and be able to, to push the changes that were, cha- that ultimately um, that we were able to push through um, and, and that the work continues. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to that point, um, Lorraine, you know, we talked about you being a mom, a young mom and or a mom with young kids in, in the legislature and a young mom. But um, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I know that some of the issues that you have been so passionate about really your whole career have, have revolved around kids, whether it was early childhood education, recently child care, as you mentioned, recently, some of the work you've done on broadband, trying to make sure that kids have access to school during COVID. So can you make the connection for us? I mean, it's so it's so important, right? To that you take your own experiences and your own, you know, knowledge and perspective into public service, right? And kind of fight for those things that you see are, are needed. So can you kind of talk about how you became a champion for some of those types of issues? 
Yeah, you know, really, my the my interest in early childhood issues came from my work with Lawton Giles because he had had his grandson had been born prematurely, very almost the same. So my son was born at 22 weeks, halfway through my pregnancy, and his son, his grandson Lawton um, the third, was born. Uh, Will and Lawton have almost the exact same story and actually that they both you know they both are visually impaired they both love music it's kind of interesting um and you know I've connected them a couple of times but Lawton had been through that and that was before we had all this brain research that we now we now have documented how important the early years of life are um, and we know that 90 percent of brain development takes place before the age of five he knew that intuitively and he knew that he, that his grandson got the care that he needed because he was the at the time a United States senator and you know had the, the, the resources that they needed to get him what he what he needed same for me you know I, so I I started out working on on early learning issues and then will was born and you know in in the hospital for four months you know, I'm a, my husband and I are both lawyers I'm a member of the legislature and it was hard to navigate the the system that we had to navigate for his care. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we obviously had good health care, but there's just so there's so much that you're facing in the in a circle and 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 it's you know every parent goes through something, and this one happened to be at you know that time of our of his life, and so it really opened my eyes to you know what. A, a single mom with without the, the resources or the education level, you know, how, how does she handle these, these types of issues and navigate the, the you know, the healthcare system, the therapies that, it, that these, you know, preemies need. Um, and, you know, now my son, you know, he's 17, but he has an IEP because he's visually impaired. You know, I battle with the school system as a public official. I'm battling for his rights and I know what they are. There are so many parents and kids that just don't have that, you know, the, that knowledge or someone to stand up and fight for them. So um, that, that while I was kind of already working in that space, it really, it, it, it being, you know, seeing it from the perspective of a, of a parent uh, really, I think gave me um, a, a lot of insight and I think a lot of credibility working on those issues because my colleagues, went through this with me and so me standing up on these issues I, I you know I think you know God put me in this place at this time for to, to be a voice and so I, we were I was I, you know I, I'm thankful that hopefully we've been able to be a an inspiration for some I mean I've asked you know I still up to Several years ago, people would say, you know, I was a mom going through this and I saw you and you, you know, knowing that you were there and, and, and willing to speak publicly about it gave me, you know, I, I knew that I could get through it. And that, you know, I, it's one of those things that you at the time, I'm like, I didn't know if it was the right thing to do or not to make this public, but I couldn't really help it because I was a public official. And I think in the, in the end, it, it enabled me to um, to hopefully create some positive change and continue to be able to do so. It's fantastic. And you continue to be such a strong and effective advocate for those issues throughout your career, frankly. So um, I'm just I, it's so inspiring, really. Um, I want to I want to go back to one other thing that you mentioned early on. We, we were talking about that question of balance and you kind of alluded to it, but you glossed over it. So I'm going to brag on you a bit. Your your uh, your mentioned something about your, you, you exercise. Well, you, you don't just exercise. You are a, an iron woman triathlete. Uh, you are uh, an amazing uh, athlete and you do a lot of running and triathlons uh, all over the place. So how does that kind of, I'm, you know, how to tell a little bit, tell us a little bit more about how kind of that, both that that's important for your balance, but also like, you know, anything that any connections you make between being an athlete and being a public servant would be interesting too, I think. Well, I do, you know, you know, an iron man is a, pretty big undertaking and it's um and I've done three of them and I I hope can I you know I want to do another one I just I like the camaraderie of the training with my part my, you know my running and biking partners um but I like to you know have a goal and work towards it and ha you know have you know a plan to get there and so much of what we do in our public life is having a goal and a plan to get there and being able to manage your time and um and that so I, I mean I think it it, it it absolutely translates to, um, you know, 
tenacity, persistence, hard work, all, all that stuff. It's, 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 it's what everybody does in, in, in our daily lives. And so it's an important part of who I am. You know, when we, we kind of decided to make that a part of my public, uh, you know, the, the campaign and it, you know, you've seen some of that. I've, I've, um, they turned it on me a little bit and tried to take away my joy and I'm not going to let them because I, I, I am proud of being a triathlete. I'm proud of, proud of being an Ironman and it's, it's an accomplishment. And I, and I, you know, it is, it does directly correlate to being a good public servant and a, and, and a disciplined athlete is a disciplined public servant, I believe. Yeah, well, you should be proud of it. And you don't let anyone take away your joy because it's, you rock. It's amazing. <laughs> it's, it's no, it's no small feat. Um, well, Lorraine, let me end with maybe just kind of where we started about public service. And, um, you know, I think it's easy for people to get, um, you know, jaded or cynical or hopeless a little bit, you know, right now with all that we're going through as a country. And I guess, um, you know, any final thoughts or words on kind of your hopefulness or any hope you have in terms of bringing us together, uh, you know, and, and, and making some real progress? Well, I think, you know, as we sit here and await the outcome of the presidential election, it is kind of hard for us, any of us to you know, those of us who've been through this so many times to, to be hopeful, but I think that it's, we have to have, we, we could, you can't wake up every day if you, if you don't think that there's a, something better on the horizon. Right. And I, um, I, I have, we, we've, we've been through a lot and our country's been through a lot. And, you know, right now there's so many people who need hope. We need these, you know, aspirational goals. We, you know, we need to be looking to, uh, we, we've got to build these bridges and come together. And I, I, I know we can do it. And I, I know um, no matter what happens, I mean, I think, I think we're going to have Joe Biden as our president and that's certainly going to be a lot easier um, for us to, to, to build the bridges and move away from the, from the divisiveness, but we are resilient and strong people. And we, you know, I think that I'm so fortunate to be part of this group of new deal leaders because I think we you know we the, during COVID we have come together in a way just the our group uh to really share experiences and I'm so encouraged by my colleagues throughout the country and I think um we've we've tapped into something here and together um all of us in our own communities um can lead us into that to that future where it is about policy and governing and public service and 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 that's where we need to be yeah, well, thank you so much, Lorian. I, you inspire me. Your fellow New Deal leaders and other state and local elected officials are on the front lines, and you have kept it going for four years through COVID, through everything else, and and you're going to keep doing it. And and I have faith and hope in uh, where we go because of people like you. So thank you so much for taking the time, election week, to uh, come be with us on an honorable profession. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you, Deb. Always good to see you. You too. Thanks for listening to An Honorable Profession. Please subscribe to hear more amazing leaders. And keep asking your elected officials to be honorable. Boots Road Group produces podcasts. I'm Ryan Coonerty, and because we keep things honorable, no tax dollars were used in the making of this podcast. <laughs>